Right, ladies and gentlemen, it's my, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, to tonight's inaugural lecture, Professor Patrick Wright. Uh, Patrick studied at the University of Kent, at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, and at the University of Birmingham. Before coming to King's, he held a number of positions, in, including as visiting professor at the University of Michigan and Alba, and as fellow of the London Consortium from 2005. He was appointed to chair at Nottingham Trent University in 2000, and in 2011, he came to the Department of English here at King's as Professor of Literature and Visual and Material Culture. In 1985, Patrick published his first book on living in an old country. And there are, this is a very rich book, and there are just two things I want to um, single out here. That first of all, this, is, this book is an extraordinary exploration of this particular moment in time at the midpoint of Thatcherism. And it, looks, it, it argues really that uh, whereas in the past, whereas 50 years before, people had looked to the future as, this sort of accelerate, as, as time as something that would accelerate towards a, a better future, um, in the, the 1980s were a time with a changed sense of the past and where they were looking back to golden past because the future seemed to be so much more uncertainty. And so the, 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 the past, as Patrick refers to it, became a well of certainty and history became celebrated in as much as it marked the recovery and reaffirmation of the old ways. But perhaps even more importantly, this book introduced an exploration of a notion that became central to Patrick's work, that of deep England, a notion that was linked to the countryside and that was critical to the notion of English identity. And this was an identification that to be shared had to be experienced. One had to be there in order to uh, participate in, in its remembrance and recollection. Identification linked to deep England refused the rationality of communication. It was simply known. And it, it was this elusiveness which made it at once exclusive, because you really had to be there, but it also made it so powerful because, um, uh, because it was so malleable. And in that way, it could be extended into different social worlds. Patrick pursues these ideas into further books. In The Village That Died for England, in, uh, written or published in 1995, he examines this notion of deep England further through the Isle of Purbeck in Dorset, where he explores the Tynham Valley, which was evacuated in late 1943 to establish an army test range during World War II. Patrick, Patrick recounts the futile campaigns after World War II to reclaim the valley from the army, but he also spends the first half of the book unearthing the memories, traditions, and identities of place that the valley evoked, precisely to articulate that identity that normally refuses public articulation, in Patrick's words. And in this way, Wright manages to expose the ideals, images, and interests of those involved in the campaign as a way of unlocking the identities linked to community, tradition, and an English sense of belonging. And so this book takes us closer to that notion of deep England without, without ever pretending that uh, this will be defined um, clearly and precisely. Deep England is something to be approached, but never to be articulated with finality. And before he published this book about Tynham, Patrick explored the notion of deep England in a completely different context through the lens of Dalston Lane in East London quote, an open archaeological site in which the story of the nation's post-war history can be tra traced out in unexpected detail. And through this world in 300 yards, Patrick chart charts the ch changing notions and debates about community, heritage, the state and the private, noting how national wider debates interacted with then detail and emotions on the ground. I mentioned these three books in greater detail because they tell a larger story about Patrick's work and its significance. And the first point I'd like to make is that um, as, important as, as, as important as Patrick's academic work is, um, is his contribution as a writer. I'm not sure that sentence makes sense, but um, uh, as a writer, broadcaster, and public intellectual, they're both of equal significance. Patrick has a rare gift of looking around him and asking some of the big questions that need to be asked that arise out of the sense, of, out of his acute sense of, of the present, and then opening up uh, up these questions to rigorous treatment so that they can inform and indeed inspire academic debate. So it's, it's as it were, a sort of inverse impact, as he likes. So it takes something out of there and take, brings it into, the, uh, uh, into academia. Second, Patrick's work is distinguished by a wonderful eye for detail, providing focused attention on the seemingly, in, seemingly insignificant with understanding, sympathy, respect, and a real sense of the comical. And this perspective also allows him 
uh, to reach new audiences, captures, to capture his readers' attention, but also to shed new light on wider issues that we thought we already knew. And we can see this gift in the books I mentioned, but also in other work. And a notable example of this is the book Tank, cultural history of, the object whose, of this object whose changing designs, capabilities, symbolic power, and promise of utopia he examined through those producing them, using them, seeing them, and experiencing, experiencing them. And third, Patrick asks new questions that need to be asked, about, uh, but always in an original way. Note just his most recent book about British interests in China. And it defies most people's obsession with the here and now, providing a much deeper and more original perspective by looking at the 1950s. But beneath these particular issues that grab his attention are long-running themes evident in his work about ruins, transformations, and conversions, about identity and community, about memory, heritage, and acts of remembrance and identification. And it is these themes that Patrick then brings from his scholarship, his academic work, then back to public debate. And so let me just conclude by giving one example of this. A few days before the Olympics opened, Patrick wrote a thoughtful piece on Danny Boyle's opening ceremony and its images on land, culture, and identity that were about to be thrust upon us and the entire world. And in this piece, Patrick asks us to use this moment to really reflect on the exclusionary aspects of the pastoral idyll with which we were confronted. Here, one might say, with reference to his earlier work, Deep England was defined and visualized in concentrated form. And through this very act, it risked exclusion by nationality, by region, and by ethnicity. But the rural idyll also posed deep questions about the status of the local and how it could help to enhance or diminish the identification of the nation. And through the scene, Patrick also invites us to consider long-running debates in British culture about the countryside idyll and a consistently changing sense of peril and, threat, and the threat to this very idea. So Patrick, in brief, is not just an inspiring, prolific, and thought-provoking academic, he's also a stimulating intellectual, and it is on both counts that we look forward to his inaugural lecture tonight entitled, The Small Society, What Happens When England Shrinks? Patrick. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jan, and uh, thank you, too, for coming. What a nice number of people it is that I see in front of me, including many whom I've met very recently and some not so recently at all. So good to see you. I'm going to read uh, for a bit. I'm, you know, it's, there's a custom around inaugural lectures, which is that you, you do read, and I don't know whether I'll be able to stick with it. I'm going to start that way. My first section is called Farewell to the Lists. Imagine that you're a young British teacher working in West Germany several decades before the lifting of the Berlin Wall. You've been employed at very short notice to teach English in a high school on the Baltic coast. Having said good morning, you ask the students what they know about England. The question provokes surprise since the class has been informed that unlike Germans who tend to be particularly anxious to find out what people thought about their country, no English person would ever dream of worrying about the same question. The answers come in slowly. An ancient kingdom, Manchester United, Lord Nelson and the Battle of Trafalgar, the mother of democracy, a passion for betting, the Whigs and the Tories, judges wearing wigs, gardens, and in addition a sense of fair play and colonies that had now been given up. At this point, a boy who has so far resisted your question and answer game grudgingly adds Shakespeare to the list. Yes, indeed, you smile reassuringly. Shakespeare is the greatest writer we have, perhaps the greatest in the world. I quote that from the German writer Siegfried Lenz's recently published novella, a Minute's Silence. He's an old man now, but this book came out in 2008. Drawing up lists of characteristic attributes has long been a familiar pastime within Britain as well. A friend and I, Jamie Muir, who's here, I'm glad to say, recently set about collecting examples, a list of lists, if you like. We started, of course, perhaps, with John Betjeman, who announced on the BBC Home Service in 1943, England stands for the Church of England, eccentric incumbents, oil-lit churches, women's institutes, modest village inns, and arguments about cow parsley on the altar. This was quickly followed by a dance cricket, critic, still living and young and healthy, 
for whom Englishness consists of fishing huge pike out of urban canals, and a more recent specimen from the English fashion designer Jasper Conran. Close your eyes, he wrote, and imagine the English countryside. What do you see or hear, feel or taste? It might be a sweep of beautiful landscape or the warmth of a roaring pub fire, perhaps a porch filled with dripping coats and muddy wellingtons, the scent of ripe apples and freshly baked bread, or the hum of bees in a sleepy kitchen garden. As it reached back, our collection of lists quickly bifurcated into two columns. To the right went the Tory versions, in which England is often mustered, even at the height of industrial and imperial expansion, as an organic, slowly accumulated, and predominantly rural inheritance to be defended against change. At the top of this column, we surely had no choice but to place Stanley Baldwin's address to the annual dinner of the Royal Society of St. George, given on St. George's Day on 6th of May, 1924. Beset as he was by political industrial strife in the cities, the Conservative Prime Minister preferred to think of England as the Worcestershire countryside around Bewley, in which he'd grown up far ago in the last century. He spoke of the tinkle of the hammer on the anvil in the country smithy, the corn crake on a dewy morning, the sound of the scythe on the whetstone. He must have known that the tractors were already advancing over that landscape, but he nevertheless hailed the sight of a plough team coming over the brow of a hill as the sight that had been seen in England since England was a land and may be seen in England long after the empire has perished and every works in England has ceased to function for centuries, the one eternal sight in England. It was this, in this conservative column of our list that we also placed Enoch Powell, who in 1964, before his notorious anti-immigration speeches, told that same Royal Society of St. George that with the British Empire now standing in what he called blackened ruins, it was time to retreat into England herself, likened to one of her own oak trees, standing and growing, the sap still rising from her ancient roots to meet the spring. Few features of hereditary old England were ever going to make it into the lists, lists we had on the left-hand column. We found snatches in a character of a characteristically socialist pastoral in Robert Blatchford's hugely popular Merry England from the 1890s and in George Lansbury's book My England from 1934. Though a man of what he called dear old ugly East London, Lansbury too looked at the countryside for an image of what England might become. A benign land, as he put it, full of birdsong and hedgerows. There were no green line coaches on his list but he does count up the improving vehicles that were already carrying the urban working classes away from the foulness of the present. His list includes the Cooperative, Trade Union and Friendly Society organizations, the Labour Party with its promise of a corporate state to come, and the agencies responsible for the spread of education among the working classes, the National Council of Labour Colleges, the Workers' Education Association, and Ruskin College in Oxford. There could be no doubt, however, that pride of place on our list of socialist lists had to be reserved for George Orwell, who sat down in 1940, the year when Britain stood alone against the Nazi forces that had already taken continental Europe, to open his tract, The Lion and the Unicorn, with a chapter called England, Your England, in which he described what it was like to come back to England from abroad. The beer is bitterer, he wrote, the coins are heavier, the grass is greener, the advertisements are more blatant. The crowds in the big towns with their mild, knobbly faces, their bad teeth and gentle manners are different from a European crowd. He goes on to count up the clatter of clogs in the Lancashire mill towns, the to and fro of the lorries on the Great North Road, the queues outside the labour exchanges, the rattle of pin tables in the Soho pubs, the old maids biking to Holy Communion through the mists of the autumn mornings. All these, he said, are not only fragments, but characteristic fragments of the English scene. But how, wonders Orwell, can one make a pattern out of this muddle? It was not an idle question. He was searching for the grounds of a patriotism that might rally not just the British, but also the understandably skeptical people of the British Empire to join a united stand against Hitler. That was hardly a problem. I'm gonna change the picture. I started with a Tory list, as you can see. Let's see what I can do with this. This is just a building right around the corner. And um, what I'm after is that window. 
Go ahead. Yeah. That business of a united stand against Hitler was hardly a problem for the man whose selection of more or less sterling Anglo-British avatars is oddly suggested by this silversmith's window just up the road. The Englishman in question was to be found living in Moscow during the 1970s and 80s. Visitors might have expected him to talk about world affairs or the circumstances that caused him to be exiled there, but he preferred to speak of England. Not much could be done to satisfy his yearning for cricket, but Kim Philby's British visitors, who included the author Graham Greene, knew that this exiled spy's list of desired English products had shrunk down to manageable proportions. So they took him Coleman's mustard, Worcester sauce, and the defiantly English yeast extract known as Marmite. Enough, then, of these lists. Each one, if remembered at all, becomes a doomed essay in timelessness. Even the more intelligent and admirable attempts to capture and fix the national identity are doomed to shrink into cliché, as the more recent fate of Orwell's far-reaching example shows. Speaking to the Conservative Group for Europe on the 3rd of April 1993, John Major tried to reassure his audience that English virtues would not be extinguished by Britain's membership of the European community. Fifty years on from now, he said, Britain will still be the country of long shadows on cricket grounds, warm beer, invincible green suburbs, dog lovers and pool spillers, and as George Orwell said, old maids bicycling to communion through the morning mist. And if we get our way, Shakespeare will still be read in schools. In Major's hands, Orwell's dynamic and open-ended list was reduced to a few cliches with which a party leader tried to reassure Eurosceptical supporters who had yet to discover that this champion of back to basics was actually jumping back and forth between Edwina Curry and the old wooden soapbox from which he liked to hold forth about the virtues of old-fashioned morality. It was a poor end for Orwell's attempt to reach out and embrace the full range of British society and beyond. Now, I'm moving on to my second section, which is called Three Reasons to Think Again. Uh, the, I've made a little cut. I did mention the rather splendid film that Martin Parr, the photographer, made in 1999 when he travelled around the frayed edges of Britain, as he called it, trying to get people to talk about England. The film was made for the BBC. It was called Think of England. And what was most, most remarkable about it was everywhere he asked people what England meant to them, and nobody had any, any answers. Um, one or two people would sort of escape muttering fair play. But the only people with any intensity in their conviction were basically racists who also wanted actually to talk about what England was not. So my point is that these, this process of exhaustion of these lists is not only reflected by politicians and writers, it's, it seems to be in the, in, the, in the general public in some ways as well. My, 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 my next section, though, is, is really about what brings me to think about these questions again. And there are three of them. Three present conditions, if I can put it that way. The first of these is the new fact of devolution within the British state. Nationalists in Scotland especially have called not just for independence for their own country, a royalist, moderate and even NATO abiding version of which Alex Salmon will apparently demand in the forthcoming referendum campaign, but for a re-articulation of England that would allow the English majority to feel okay about saying farewell to the unitary British state. This call was advanced influentially by Tom Nairn in the breakup of Britain, 1977, and also earlier. It's there in the thinking of Hamish Henderson and others who hauled the Scottish nationalist cause out of obscurity in the years following the Second World War. A pamphlet called Our Three Nations, published in 1957 by Plaid Kimru, the SNP, and for England, the Commonwealth Party, also hoped for a new England a post-imperial land where there might be, and perhaps this is another list in the making, fairer elections, new provincial assemblies, a proliferation of cooperative initiatives, and an upsurge of associational activity in which scores of more or less sclerotic voluntary associations would burst into new and really useful life. Paradoxically, wrote these advocates of confraternity, there may even be a resurgence of English patriotism and national consciousness to take the place of the lost sense of empire. If the idea of a New England has taken off at all in recent years, it's partly thanks to the anxious denial of the failing Labour government led by Gordon Brown, who recoiled from the very thought of English resurgence. One of the most telling images of Brown's time at the helm, in my judgment, is of Brown himself appearing on the Andrew Marr show in April 2010, 
and remaining in the studio after his interview to look on. One imagines in a fairly perplexed state as a strangely feathered apparition named PJ Harvey performed an early version of her anti-war song, Let England Shape. All such signs of English resurgence went under the carpet during that government, as did the irksome challenge of the so-called West Lothian question, not surprisingly, because Scottish MPs were central to the passage of lots of policies in England, including the setting up of foundation hospitals, and also, of course, the introduction of student tuition fees, which Scottish students presently don't pay. Scotland may have got a parliament and Wales an assembly, but England had been invited to put up with nine mostly unelected regional assemblies, which were seen as overriding local politics, and the majority of which indeed were silently abolished in March 2010. When people started campaigning for an English parliament, it was, all, it was assumed that they were extreme UKIPers, or, and probably racists too, which some no doubt were. The new Labour response to this was to send out the old English bruiser John Prescott to insist that there was no such thing as English nationality and that people had better get used to being British. So the question of England has been revived, either a pernicious racist fantasy or a site of desired democratic renewal. But also an idea of the English as, in terms that will shortly take me back to G.K. Chesterton, as the secret people who are not allowed to speak their name. Against this background, it's interesting, perhaps, and not surprising, that a number of members of so-called minority communities have been quite voluble about their support for Britishness rather than Englishness. The second condition that I want to mention is the resurgence of, the, which sort of brings me to this sense of why England is an issue again at the moment, is to do with developments in Europe. These obviously include the acute and unresolved crisis of the Eurozone, but there are also a number of more long-standing issues the pursuit of integration, centralized regulation of many areas of activity in the member states, and a particular form of state-led policy formation. Such matters must be a legitimate past part of public and government concern within the nations. Yet the polemical atmosphere in which Nigel Farage's UKIP has been finding such popularity in England and using it to press against the Conservative Party is hardly conducive to the kind of enlightened public reasoning that the Victorian moralist Matthew Arnold saw as the role of critical thought, i.e. contesting mechanical thinking, not reproducing it, and floating sedimented ideas so that issues could be properly appraised in the round and in the new. Indeed, the mechanical thinking, which is, end which is endlessly reiterated polarizations, has been so constant that the European Commission has set up a blog, a kind of rebuttal unit, which sets out to engage and dismantle Euro myths as they surface in the British press. Recent examples, it's worth looking at, include health and safety regulations alleged to prescribe the use of jam jars that virtuous country people might use to sell pickles and other condiments at fates, the banning of classic cars, including Morris Miners, from passing their MOT if anybody has done anything to adjust them since they were built, the decree obliging the poor ex-Trotskyist Eric Pickles to fly an EU flag outside the Department of Communities and Local Government, banning imperial measures actually agreed before we even joined the common market, banning curved bananas, decreeing that the popular snack Bombay mix must be renamed Mumbai mix, <laughs> Mumbai mix, outlawing our yogurt, banning even the poles down which British farmers have traditionally enjoyed sliding. It's allegedly feared that the first to slide down in an emergency might get squashed at the bottom. I suppose I, have to, I could go on. Curtailing the breeding of pedigree dogs including the Queen's Corgis. So these sorts of images, even the Save Our Jugs campaign from the sun, um, which is all about how rules about exposing people to sunlight um, should be used to stop women who work in bars exposing any cleavage at all. So you've got this kind of ridiculous mixture of policy issues which are perfectly legitimate, I think, whatever one thinks, and this sort of super mad polemical climate in which ideas of the traditional British way of life, and particularly perhaps the English way of life, since in Scotland these issues play quite differently, um, and also in Wales, and no doubt Northern Ireland to some extent. But you've got these, this kind of strong and difficult and challenging mixture of symbolic rhetoric, of this constant sense of threat and corruption, which is to the fore at the first moment. Um, the third factor, though, which of course is equally important, 
that, uh, that I wanted to just put, in the, put on the table, so to speak, is th to do with the new patterns of mobility, dislocation, and settlement within the transnational and increasingly globalized economy we all live in. British membership of the EU has brought new waves of migration to Britain, much of it from the formerly communist East. Polish shops have opened in English towns where the native population shows no interest whatsoever in joining London, and perhaps especially Islington, in its appetite for cosmopolitan del delicatessens. There have been sporadic waves of panic, panic about border control, which does indeed appear to have been more or less completely lost over recent years, and these have been followed in a further example of bad government by reactive measures which have come down with disproportionate severity on some visitors, including international students from beyond, of course, the EC, and I have to say not from everywhere beyond the EC, perhaps. These anxieties about belonging are not just a reaction to EC migrants. For half a century now, and in some senses longer, the former British Empire has been t busy turning itself outside in, in British cities. If many have learned to travel along with the experience of hybridity and the new intersections that are possible in music, food, literature, and other forms, there are others who experience this new variousness as an alarming provincialization of England, a dislocation of customary ways of life. In the art galleries and universities, this has been the moment of post-colonial studies, an absolutely appropriate response to this situation. Um, which tends to see the migrant, nonetheless, as the representative subject of the age we're living in, an age defined by mobility and these global flows I mentioned earlier. Yet this new mobility also raises questions about the fate of those who don't or can't or won't move and who feel disturbed in their experience of settlement. This question has been on the mind of Lord Maurice Glassman, the blue labor thinker who raised the issue in the summer of last year. He's surely right that the people moved by these feelings of dislocated settlement should not be left to be gathered up as disgruntled, disgruntled aborigines by the English Defence League. However, and to the concern of many colleagues in the Labour Party, he too quickly moved on to call, he too, and also perhaps too quickly, moved on to call for better border control and a renegotiation of EU membership around that self same question. I'm going to try to have another picture. Yeah, this will do. Uh, my next section is called Elegies and Miniaturization. Our, our present 21st century conjuncture remains generous to commentators who enjoy playing the old game of heritage and danger, finding some aspect of the traditional English way of life and then hurling condemnation at this or that often politically correct force threatening to destroy it. In the 1980s and 90s, this was already a well-tried journalistic reflex that could be used to generate a passionate newspaper article on almost anything. Scratching away at England's itch and lamenting the decline in national standards was a staple of the Daily Telegraph's Peter Simple column when it was written by Michael Wharton and devoted to standing firm against, quote, the moral degeneration of England and the toxic bureaucracy typified by the welfare state and the hated apparatus he claimed to have been the first to dub the race relations industry. Auburn War must have written hundreds of articles saying the unsayable about threats to the English way of life. He attacked Shirley Williams as worse than Hitler for setting up comprehensive schools. And he denounced the laws against drunk driving as an assault on rural hospitality. And all the better for the fact that he didn't necessarily mean it. I mean, these, these articles were effective, but I remember various times sort of saying, really, this is appalling stuff. Somebody should be arguing back. And I remember somebody who's now a very influential columnist on a liberal newspaper telling me, oh, you know, don't you know better than to take bronze seriously? And that, that horrible sort of sense that we just had to listen to all this. And, you know, they could say what they want because they didn't really mean it. And, you know, you'd be a, a sort of fish-eyed guardian reader to respond. It was, an, it was an interesting lot. And it was, to me, very interesting to, to be working. I worked for The Guardian at that time. And there's no question that this mach machine, this sort of polarization machine that generated these articles endlessly in the right-wing press was fairly matchless. We didn't have anything equivalent. I mean, it's much harder to make cases for sort of not particularly perfect social welfare reforms and provisions. I mean, we were lumbering on. And we weren't always helped by the senior people at The Guardian who, at that time, admired nothing more than David English's <coughs> Daily Mail. And I have to say, even looked at their own earnest, earnest readers' columns on the letters page with a certain amount of discomfort. So, you know, we, we were up against this in a big way then. 
Um, and it seems to me that that system, that sort of heritage and danger form of scratching away type of journalism is still working overtime and hard. Um, the machine is still generating copy for many of the tabloid press's most richly reported journalists. Richard Littlejohn, Melanie Phillips, Rod Little, Peter Hitchens on the Mail on Sunday. I mean, these are people, I'm, I'm not saying people shouldn't have views that I don't agree with, but I think the, the, the level of the polemic and the automatism of the polemic suggests that arguments are always made in excess and they're always made in a field of contrast. For some recent commentators, though, it seems that England, far from just being under threat, has finally been killed off, and, that, and all a patriotic commentator can do now is to toss dried flowers at the grave. Publishers have been printing a steady stream of elegies. In 2003, Byron Rogers used the title The Last Englishman for his biography of Kettering, this devoutly provincial teacher, writer, map maker, and conservationist, J.L. Carr. The historical novelist, novelist Peter Van Sittart, almost completely forgotten, interesting writer, closed his book in memory of England with the lament that the detritus of Albion is now left to literature, antiquarianism, Hollywood, and commercials. Roger Scruton followed with England an elegy a few years later in 2000. In The Philosopher on Dover Beach, two years before that, he was still fighting. There, he declared that the real price of maintaining a national community is sanctity, intolerance, exclusion, and a sense that life's meanings depend upon obedience and also on vigilance against the enemy. But he opened England an el elegy on a much more defeated note. My aim, he wrote, is that of all funeral orations, to praise the dead, and to cheer the survivors. The last bit is not so easily done with a book of lamentations that closes with the observation when your fundamental loyalty is to a place and its genius loci, globalization and the loss of sovereignty bring a crisis of identity. This can be extended to television dramas. In 2011, the producer of the crime drama Midsummer Murders was suspended for calling his program the last bastion of Englishness. It was, I'm afraid, a reference to the absence of black faces, a characteristic that we might also remember as the Notting Hill Syndrome, if you remember the film. Elegies may form one of the ways in which England has talked to itself in recent years, or been talking to itself, but a tendency towards miniaturization has been another. Probably, I've got a, yeah, that's right, I've got a picture for you. In Julian Barnes's England, England, 2003, that came out, an entrepreneur named Jack Pittman builds a theme park in which everything of touristic interest in England is concentrated on the Isle of Wight, an idea that coincidentally seems to follow the idea of the Welsh architect Clough Williams Ellis, who shortly after the Second World War imagined all the National Trust buildings relocated to the Isle of Wight and shuddered with horror at the effect. Many English children, meanwhile, are still being raised on Mary Norton's The Borrowers or the stories of Reverend Audrey, whose railway books are set here on an imaginary island of Sodor. It's like an offshore tax haven, really. It's between England and the um, Isle of Man. And, this prompt one, and it's, a, it's a stories that do prompt one to wonder whether mi miniaturization can really still be essential to making technology acceptable to the English imagination, trains. Be that as it may, in the privatizing 1980s and 90s, miniaturization was a policy applied to the state. As huge projects like restructuring the economy or comprehensively redeveloping cities or running the National Health Service slid or were forced into the past, we entered a period of Lilliputian state measures. This England's list, this particular England's li list, would include John Major's traffic cones hotline the heritage lamppost that councils were putting up when they couldn't afford to do housing projects, the often ghastly public art project, and the one-person-operated street cleaning machines introduced, as I remember very well, to Oxford Street by Westminster Council at just about the same time as Dame Shirley Porter, leader of that council, was selling off cemeteries for a pound and using council housing policy to rig local elections. There was, as we heard in the next door room the night before last, a literary response to this sense of shrinkage in the form of scale, a short story Will Self wrote during the early 90s, in which he set between the motorway on which John Major had lamented the absence of service stations and the model village of Beckenscott opened in Beaconsfield in 1929 and still attracting many visitors today. That's a nice English picture for you, a derelict model village. Who else could find that but a man who scours the websites of 
miniature train enthusiasts. <laughs> Will Self's junky narrator stands among the little houses and the model trains of Beckinscott, like Gulliver in Lilliput. When I found myself on my feet, says Gulliver, I looked about me and must confess I never beheld a more entertaining prospect. The country round appeared like a continued garden and the enclosed fields, which were generally 40 foot square, resembled so many beds of flowers. Those fields were intermingled with woods of half a stang and the tallest trees, as I could judge, appeared to be seven foot high. I viewed the town on my left hand, which looked like the painted scene of a city in a theater. We may now see the John Major years as a mere pause before the new liberal economy really started moving under Blair. Yet that idea of England as a little enclosed world has been turning up in other guises. Until I joined King's last year, I used to drive regularly, many, perhaps most weeks of the year, for, t for a full 10 years, I think, back and forth between Cambridge and Nottingham. As I turned off the A1, joining the A606 near Stamford in Lincolnshire, I used to have this curious sensation of having passed through some sort of time slip and entering, entered an old world. No sign, of course, of Stanley Baldwin's horse-drawn plough, and the view was quite often obscured by, well, I have to say, UKIP posters, or at times of particular crisis, more improvised ones, um, which, and wilder ones connected to foot and mouth disease, perhaps, or to BSE. I remember one that read bollocks to the bureaucrats and burgers to the EC, which I thought was a bit of a classic. <laughs> However, I did get ancient glimpses all the same of what? Red barns, brick barns, stone houses, small and hedged fields, ridged and ancient looking hills. I was driving through Rutland, a fox hunting county which is proud of its status as the smallest in England. Maltum in parvo, much in little, reads the proudly displayed, displayed county motto. The county town of Oakham is smart but small. I used to drive straight through the middle, partly because I could hardly believe it had recently been bypassed, perhaps even with the help of EC money, and partly because I like to glance at this image. Smallest, it's on a tiny house. <laughs> so this is, you know, one's talk about deep England and what do you find there, but this wonderful story of this man, Geoffrey Hudson, who in a remote age is said actually to have been baked in a pie or served up to some visiting royal in a pie. So they cut the pie open and as he jumped, they do these things in sort of stag do's but without using short people. Um, anyway, so though endangered by its smallest once, it's interesting, the Rutland is proud of its status as a recovered county. It was merged into Leicestershire in the local government reorganization in 1974, but separated out again to the satisfaction, to the, to the great satisfaction of a local resistance movement in 1997. Um, these people, who I photographed at the Rutland Agricultural Show in 2010, may look fairly antique and or sort of old fashioned and even sort of one cultural, monocultural from an urban point of view, a contemporary urban point of view. And I think it is true that you could say that their world has shrunk. It was certainly backed off from the mixed urban realities of Leicester, which is a very various town and which is only 14 miles away. But I wouldn't dare to say that any of these people don't have an atmosphere of confidence among them. Um, this is not a place that uh, I need to particularly question, but it's interesting to find it. But you do sense that um, the difference between the urban population and this world of the countryside in some places, and perhaps in Rutland a little bit more than in others, is quite remarkable. According to the American writer and scholar Susan Stewart, the defining characteristic of all miniature worlds is not just that they are small, but that they are heavily reliant on the boundaries that preserve their enclosed interiority. Trespass, contamination, and the erasure of materiality are the threats presented to the enclosed world. And so it is with many expressions of Englishness. Our modern literature is full of stories which combine a more or less defensive shrinkage on the one hand with a fear of encroachment and usurpation on the other. We become hobbits, but only to find the Shire up against Mordor 
We become Neanderthals, as in Golding's novel, The Inheritors, only to find ourselves looking out through leaves in a developed version of Sabanac Forest as cleverer, more articulate, and far better qualified people than us turn up to take our place. We become rabbits, if we like, as in Watership Down, 1972, bestseller of the year, and end up being chased out of our warrens and in the rush for a new home, quite deprived of the one activity that seems most natural to rabbits. We climb into a bedroom wardrobe, only to find the way to Narnia blocked by a stiff, dark, impenetrable, and probably also dripping pine forest, which was almost certainly planted there by the Forestry Commission, a state body that from the moment of its establishment in 1919 was reviled for overriding property rights and covering the native landscape with alien trees. The same can even be said for road signs. Take a good look at this one that stands on the approach to the Kennington roundabout on Oxford's Abington Road. Patrick Keeler did just that in his recent film, Robinson in Ruins. Indeed, he, or rather his Robinson, dwell on this notice, registering not just the routine instruction, but as they get closer, the lichen growing out from the edge of the letters to form a curious head-shaped explosion. I worked with Patrick Keeler on this film, so I can tell you that he told me that this lichen is a variety called Xanthoria parietina, a variety which apparently thrives on car exhaust. This growth is registered in, the, the, in Keeler's film as a sort of aberrant eruption, obscuring the otherwise clean edges of letters printed in transport font, created as Keeler also informed me and his other fellow researchers, by Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert in the 1960s as part of a color-coded road signage system which the Design Museum now commemorates as one of the most ambitious information design projects ever undertaken in Britain. In one th sequence filmed over two days, Keeler closes in on that road sign until the lichen itself becomes oddly communicative, pointing Robinson in the direction not just of Newbury, but of the district of that town known as Spenumland. It does this by acquiring a peculiar resemblance to one of Berkshire's magistrates who, in 1795, gathered at Spenumland's Pelican Inn to make what Raymond Williams would describe as a last disastrous attempt to preserve the old social order of the countryside by subsidizing starvation wages through the rates. Lingering as Keeler obliges his viewer to do over the sight of that expanding patch of lichen, I found myself thinking of a different correspondence. Not to the Sp Spenum magistrates whose decision Keeler introduces through Karl Polanyi's study, The Great Transformation, The Political and Economic Origins of Our Time, but to a number of other images that seem to work with the same theme of, 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 of encroachment and which of course Keeler reverses because he puts it on a modern thing, which is being encroached on which is not the way many of these work. I thought, for example, of Revilius. This is the Bratton White Horse. Um, and, it's, and then I thought of Peter Kennard, who does the same, only reverses it. I mean, he's got cruise missiles in the hayway, which is a, you know, a painting that was made as a sort of, pro well, a sort of a purposeful painting at a time when cruise missiles were indeed being pulled out of places like Greenham Common and and were, they were going to be fired from behind the hedges so nobody could spot where they were and bomb them or whatever people do with cruise missiles. Um, so but what's interesting to me about this idea of kind of an encroachment that Keeler's image sort of somehow plays an odd, well, it sort of evokes and does odd things with, is that it sort of comes out, it sort of seems to identify a tradition of thinking which uses the land to talk about um, you know, change and development and modern experience. The Revilius paintings were done at a time when these images were about to be turfed over uh, for reasons of, this is the sec Second World War, so that they couldn't be used as navigation by planes going to drop bombs on Bristol or wherever. Um, but interestingly, I think they also rhyme in, in, in a conceptual sense with this line from uh, G.K. Chesterton and his once extremely well-known poem, The White Horse, of the, of the White Horse Vale. No, it's actually, well, anyway. The turf crawled, and the fungus crept, and the little sorrel, while all men slept, and wrought the work of man. Chesterton's archaic white horse is presented as the positive term here, in a narrative that values its chosen embodiment of the nation by projecting it against a host of negative forces threatening to obliterate it. Though strongly polarized, 
the two terms also become vital to each other's definition. The valued nation tends to be thrust back into the past by the contrast, closed off and represented as an endangered heritage. The present, meanwhile, is stripped of its open-ended potentiality and reduced to a more or less overwhelming threat of obliteration. So this is a kind of way of thinking, um, a way of imagining nationality at the point where it's poised against threatening change. And it seems to me that although Revilius is often cited as an example of a man whose imagination was both romantic and modern, there is a very strong undercurrent in much of this work which actually doesn't find it at all easy to put those two things together. And I'm, what I want to do for the next chunk of my talk, I think we're doing all right for time, although I seem to have lost my watch. Um, you can shout at me or go to sleep in unanimously and I'll get the message. Um, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the historical background and see what, we, what history can let us understand about the way this particular form of thought has developed in Britain. Good Lord, when did I start? Okay. Well, my, my starting point, you could say, the word, you could follow the word encroachment all the way back to the very beginning of, of land enclosure. Um, there's a man called John Reynolds who led a rather wonderful thing called the Midland Rising of 1607, who protested against the smart of these encroaching tyrants who were carrying out enclosures across Warwickshire. So the idea of encroachment has a long history, which goes right back into the history of the agrarian revolution. Um, and as for the idea of England as a little wor world, it's in, of course, the famous uh, John of Gaunt speech in Richard II. But I think the decisive history here begins in the early 19th century. And I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to get to this figure, Faust. Um, this is a, 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 an idea that I find in Marshall Berman's book, All That Is Solid Melts Into Air. Um, what, what, what Berman points out is that um, in the early 19th century, in this period that he describes as the coming of modernity, which is a, a mixture of a new form of capitalism, industrialism, and the beginnings of a new, for, new set of claims for democracy, you get this kind of strange mixture where you get a precipitation of huge transformation and change out of which, sorry, you get that's the main driver, but out of it, which you get this creation of sort of compensatory little worlds, as he calls them. He explains this with reference to Goethe's Faust, a verse drama in which Faust is seen not so much as the necromancer or the medieval figure of Dr. Faustus, but as the prototype of what Berman calls the developer a figure who carves his will on the world, but whose transformative activities also create a characteristic reaction. Berman attributes Goethe's drama to an epoch whose thought and sensibility are modern in a way that present-day readers can recognize at once, but whose material and social conditions are still medieval. He describes Faust as the bearer of a dynamic culture within a stagnant society. And the split that tears him and divides him between inner and outer life was then pervasive in European society. The little world is a product of this, a remnant of the life from which Faust himself comes and to which he lays waste through his own actions. It's a childhood world that his whole adulthood has forced him to forget. And it can still tug at him in, say, the sound of church bells ringing or Easter. The little world is present in the closed world of the devoutly religious small town from which Gretchen emerges into the story. Berman suggests that Faust's love for Gretchen transforms her, fills her with a sense of development, and leaves her unable to go back, and indeed doomed, since the little world from which she has been plucked turns against her with a barbaric cruelty and vindictive fury and destroys both her and her baby. As Berman suggests, modern history is full of little worlds, evoked, longed for, but emptied out and transformed into hollow shells. Goethe includes another example in, in his Faust, in the characters of Philemon and Baucis. Um, I have to show you Faust as the developer, but that's Philemon and Baucis, an old, very old picture of Philemon and Baucis. They are, in fact, brought into Faust from Ovid's Metamorphosis, um, an elderly couple who have a little cottage on the dunes, a chapel with a little bell, a garden full of linden trees. They offer aid and hospitality to shipwrecked sailors and wanderers. 
Over the years, they've become beloved as the one source of life and joy in this wretched land. For Fausto, they are people who are in the way. There's Faust, the developer, and there's our modern Philippa, you know, there you are, sorry, Philemon and Baucis. I mean, these are the people who are standing out against this golf course in Aberdeen. Um, but the point, what happens in, in, in Goethe's story is that Faust has these people, has Philemon and Baucis removed. He tells Mephisto, get rid of those people, and is later informed that they've been killed and their house has been burned to the ground. Now, the little world of modernity, as Berman calls it, can be followed forward. It's quite interesting if you're, I've been teaching 19th century literature for the first time in a while, and it's been quite interesting to follow this idea through the works of Zola, Baudelaire, Huysman, even, even Strindberg, who is in, in his inferno, who's in this mad alchemical tract. The little world ends up in the bathtub in which he's trying to make gold, sort of in the, in the sedimentation. He suddenly sees these images of a rural, simple world. You can find it in Corbusier, he has these interesting comments about the, the man whose world will never be possible to coexist with functional urbanism. He talks about the man working in a little booth with his family all around him. But in England, the key figure is none of, none of these people. My suggestion is that it's, it's basically got to be William Cobbett, the man who wrote Rural Lives. Um, uh, there he is. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to start moving a bit faster than my text would suggest at this point. So I think I'm going to stop reading. Cobbett basically is a man who spent much of the early 18th century, early 19th century, sorry, uh, certainly through the 1820s and into a bit of the 1830s, um, mapping and tracking and objecting to what was going on in the English countryside. He saw an English countryside that was being caught up in a new form of capitalism. In the agrarian revolution, he saw uh, governments operating through war, raising huge tax burdens that were placed on the countryside. He saw, um, he traveled around the country, he did his famous rural rides, and the things he hated, he was, these are, these are, he's, it's the, the, the whole of his tone of his thought is full of love for the rural community, which he sees being displaced and threatened and reduced. Um, and the people forced into the most terrible forms of misery. And then he, he sits on the, there's that on one side, and then you've got all this, you know, kind of modern development happening on the other side. So he's, he's a great hater. He would, he would go around talking to audiences wherever he was. He edited and created and wrote his own newspapers. He was extremely courageous. He was jailed for his views. Um, and he used to deliver wonderful, uh, opinionated, speeches which he preferred to call harangues. He would go into towns, he would get off his horse, he would walk around the market square so everybody knew he was there in many cases. He would find himself a nice hotel window overlooking the market square and he would open the window and start getting crowds to gather and he would harangue. But the issue with Cobbett is that he basically um, was the founder of a kind of tabloid journalism as well. He was, um, he was, he was a polarizer. He, he saw the world in completely stark terms. He subscribed to very simplistic views of history. So, for example, he saw the Reformation and the dissolution of the monasteries as entirely the cause of the beginning of the rot. Um, he thought that, uh, um, well, he thought the national debt, if it could only be lifted, would the, the problems might be seriously eased. Marx was very critical of him for that simple belief. He believed excessively in parliamentary reform, and of course, when it came there was a lot of disappointment in the wings. But the interesting thing to me about Cobbett is that he does produce um, a view of uh, what England is in, its, in it, a hugely influential view of England as being something that is constantly being pushed back into a historical form. So um, to give you two examples uh, of the way he thinks, I'm gonna give you another image actually. This is um, his favorite place, uh, you know, I mean, he was going through a countryside that was full of, you know, farmers trying to move upwards, vicars who wouldn't bother to deliver sermons but went off to watch their daughters get more and more gentrified and genteel in Bath or wherever. And what he talked about was where he would, the best place in England, he thought, and he chose this place here. I've been looking for it for a while. I got it wrong the last time I was down there, but I've actually found it now. He talked about the Wiley Valley between Warminster and Salisbury, 
Um, and he described this little town, little village called Norton Bavant. And um, this is what it is. And what he likes, so he's a farmer, so he knows about land. And what he's talking about is um, a, a, a farm that runs from this sort of chalk upland, which is now all military, um, down into arable fields and then down to the wiley, to the water meadows. So you've got these three agricultural types. And he goes round this village, and of course, it's, uh, this is what it's like now. He sees a, a, a village that has been completely organized around a large house um, in which uh, 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 an MP has kept two, of, two sisters of a man, an MP called Bennett, live there. Uh, Bennett is a man who's thrived on rotten boroughs and all this stuff that Cobbett sees as the end of England. Um, and he doesn't like it. So he, he, this isn't what he wants. He sees this as absolutely the rot of the countryside. And he chooses his farm up this road. It's called Middleton Farm now. And I didn't go and knock on the door. But that's it. Now, there's no doubt that's been smartened since 1826 or whenever it was. And I don't think it would have had bay windows. But what he, what he saw was this small farm that was intact. It had ancient trees around it, this ancient landscape around it. And it had these, um, these working buildings. And so for him, England was absolutely uh, concentrated in the definition of a place like this. This was where he wanted to be. And it was, it was his choice, in a sense, of the kind of place he wanted. So there was a, 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 ne a sort of desperate belittlement about it, and yet also a virtuous one. He was very keen on the idea that um, you know, this, was, this was what you had to be. This was where the things should have gone before the huge over-sophistication took off. Um, going back, if I can, I will, the, the so that's no use, I'll just have them recorded again, do bear with me. The, the other thing I wanted to say about Cobbett is that in the course of his rides, he developed a way of thinking about people, which seems to me to be um, quite, quite sort of alarming and, and troublesome. Uh, and you can understand it historically, but it has great consequences, I think. He, he comes, there's a point at which he's riding through a place called Tangley. You won't believe it, I've been too far again. Yeah, there it is. Um, <laughs> forget about it, I'll tell you about it. He's riding, yeah, do, thank you. He's riding through a place called Tangley. Um, and he comes across, uh, as he gets lost. Basically, he's, he's on his horse. He's in Hampshire, and he gets lost um, because he's beating flies off himself with the bough of a tree. And losing his way, he stops in a village called Tangley, and he rides up to the gate of a cottage uh, where he finds a woman of about 30 of years of age living there with her two children. They have this conversation. It's a very small conversation. He greets her and asks, which is the way to Luggershaw, which I knew could not be more than about four miles off. She didn't know. A very neat, smart, and pretty woman, but she didn't know the way to this rotten borough, which I was, I was sure, only about four miles off. Well, my dear good woman, said I, but you have been at Luggersall. No. Nor at Andover, six miles another way. No. Nor at Marlborough, nine miles another way. No. Pray, were you born in this house? Yes. And how far have you ever been from this house? Oh, I've been up in the parish and over to shoot. That is to say, the utmost extent of her voyages have been about two and a half miles. Now, Cobbett really likes this lady, and he, he manages to do so without having much more conversation with her than that. And what interests me about it, I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of curious, because it seems to me that she's, she's a kind of type of what Cobbett sees and encourages us to think about. She's, she's a woman, and I think this, this is a type of sort of English subjectivity to this day. She's, she's, a, she's a woman who's distinguished really by the fact that nothing has happened to her. And I, d I don't mean that to be patronizing. I mean, Cobbett, obviously she's got a life and Cobbett doesn't do anything to enter there. He doesn't find a name out or anything. But what you, what you feel is that she's significant to him because she hasn't been traumatized. She hasn't been mistreated. She hasn't been victimized. So you, you're dealing with a kind of sense of the person. I mean, obviously this Cobbett's a man and this lady is a woman. So those issues are probably at play. But there is something here about the way in which Cobbett describes this person, which I think is, is um, indicative in a sense of how, you know, at this point in history, uh, the, 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 the English, the sort of true-born English person becomes a, an early member of the secret people, to quote um, G.K. Chesterton's poem, the people who, who, you know, haven't spoken yet, who haven't nobody really, you know, they're there, they're still around. But they're, it's, a, it's a sort of strangely passive definition, I think, 
And it's one that um, has a lot of mileage in it in terms of moving forward. But for Cobbett, anyway, the idea of mobility has become inseparable from pauperization and dispossession. We're not informed whether this woman of Tangley was the wife of a farmer, a tenacious peasant, or a craftsman, or indeed of a landless but luckless, luckless storehouse laborer. As a representative of a rooted way of life that was defined by vertical depth as opposed to horizontal extension, she was distinguished by her fortunate lack of experience, by the mere fact of still being there, and by the equally blessed fact that the dislocation experienced by so many had not happened to her. So, in a sense, she's not had the experience, well done, of this um, poor family in this famous late 18th century engraving of for after the desert, deserted village of our family being turfed off the land which has been taken from them. She's been spared the experience we also know very well from John Clare. Now, what I want to suggest with um, Cobbett, uh, the people who read him, the people who have written his biography, they've always been concerned about the sort of polemical aspects of his vision, the either orism, the sharpness of it, the obviously the extension into conspiracy theories. I mean, Cobbett is quite capable, by no means only alone in this, but he's quite capable of letting his hatred of the financial system extend into, you know, kind of anti-Semitic forms of expression. There's lots that's quite difficult about him and quite unacceptable, but the, to us, the question though going forward seems to be that we just run and run with this sense of polarization. Give us another slide. Okay, let's move through these ones. Um, Pugin, the Gothic revivalist architect, comes up with a similar sense of contrast. Um, he, can we get it, keep going, keep going, keep going? He basically, in the 1820s, sits down, no, 1830s, writes this book called Contrast. It's his first book. It's a set of drawings. More? Sorry. Yeah, you're nearly there. Yeah, yeah, keep going. There it is. Um, the, 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 and this is a system of contrasts. I mean, he, he's, he's contrasting the old with the good. And in this situation, where, where, where Cobbett's got these people still in the countryside, but the countryside, the, the rural community is threatened with sort of being destroyed or being thr thrust violently back into history, Pugin is a few years later, really a very few later, say, years later, saying that architectural quality is already a feature of the distant past the Gothic revival. This is a point that Raymond Williams made in Culture and Society, that Cobbett goes into Pugin. Let's have one more, very appropriate, this one. It's the, you know, you've got two gates, a college in Oxford and King's College London. Um, and of course, not only is that, was that King's College London, but the one on the left, which is seen as a kind of barbaric, mediocre structure, but it's already been pulled down and we've got an even more brutalist entrance now. Um, but this goes, I mean, it seems to me that you can find the same thought in Ruskin. Uh, the whole country is but a little garden, he writes, or rather roars, in a lecture entitled Of Queen's Gardens. But rather than letting children run on the lawns of that little garden, you've turned it into a furnace ground and piled it up with cinders. You get this in many Victorian thinkers. It's quite interesting in William Morris, this shrinking away from the modern, this turning to the past, this turning to nature, I mean, Ruskin's involvement with the Lake District is influential in setting up the, the National Trust, as we know. With William Morris, you, get the, you also get that sense of the medieval as the source of virtue, and then you get news from nowhere, which is this extraordinary um, Thameside utopia, which actually, if you read it, I was reading it again the other day, and it works in an interesting way, and I'm sure Marx wouldn't really have approved of the way Morris finds his future, his perfect future, because it works by subtraction. What Morris does is he takes things out. As he writes of Hammersmith in his first chapter, his dreamer wakes up in Hammersmith and it's no longer full of all the filth of the 19th century. And, and what he says there is um, the soap works with their smoke vomiting chimneys were gone. The engineers works, gone. The lead works, gone. And as you go through this book, everything is gone. Most of London is gone. There's lots of trees everywhere, so which is one of the reasons why you end up being, an e Morris ends up with this sort of very strong ecological cast, because most of the houses have been taken out. Politics have gone. The law has gone. Um, marriage has sort of, is sort of gone. So education has gone. He de-schooled the societies. Then as he goes up the river in the second part of that book, what happens is you realize that even the iron bridges have gone because iron is a sign of industrialism. So subtraction, subtraction, subtraction. When you get to the end of the Thames, where you come to this goal, this perfect England, which is sort of strangely the future, but also oddly the past, 
um, that all the descriptions of it are about littleness. The more he goes up the Thames, the more that is taken out, you end up with another little world. And that's what Morris does in News From Nowhere. Um, now, these ideas of the little, the English as the little, the, the beleaguered, the traditional, the unstated, the organic, but unspoken, against mechanism, machinery, all these modern social forms, are picked up and taken through the 20th century. The key figure there, in my reading of this, is um, G.K. Chesterton, Hilaire Belloc. Belloc, in 1906, visited Ely, which was then really only a cathedral village with um, the cathedral in about four or five streets. And he said, the corner of a corner of England is infinite and can never be exhausted. He came up with these lines that the sort of depth that is in the place is, and you've got the same with, I mean, Chesterton was saying very similar things, fighting with Fabians like Shaw and Wells and arguing against Kipling that he has an interesting thing, an essay called Making the World Small in which he's arguing with Kipling's idea of the British Empire and of imperial travel. Kipling had said um, that he that only knows England doesn't know England at all. I mean, you know that famous saying. And, and Chesterton's answer is, no, 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 it's travel that makes you superficial. If you travel, you never see. It was like English Taoism, that you, you reach a destination without traveling. And so he then starts talking about the man in the cabbage patch the English man in the cabbage patch, who understands far more and experiences life more deeply than the traveler. And you get this whole sort of modern reorganization of this same polarization. Now, what I want to do, because I am going to stop now, is come to my conclusion. My take on this is that this way of thinking in terms of encroachment and the modern as, as, as extinguishing or threatening of what's valuable about the English experience, extends through the 20th century in various forms. It informs a lot of the conservationist organizations in the campaigns around um, the 20s and 30s. Think of the titles of books like Britain and the Beast, that sense of polarization very strongly expressed. It goes to the far right in the sense that lots of sort of semi-fascistic or totally fascistic organizations are into organic food and they're into this idea of you know, the past of, of you know, medieval forms of life, the medi medieval hierarchy of the village as a model for future society or for re-enchanting the defeated English land. I mean, you know, these are the people who are meeting to take redundant miners and turn them into, to, to settle them on the land and turn them into sort of guild socialist yeoman again. There were these sorts of movements. But interestingly, it was also very powerful on the left. I mean, so if you look at, um, I don't know whether the Comintern actually uh, ever at some point made a decision that all the historians in the European Communist parties must go out and find the origins of the so working class movement in their own countries. But certainly the, the movement back into um, the agrarian experience in England was very strong in the 50s. All those very, very powerful historians. I mean, Christopher Hill with the Norman yoke. You know, I mean, in fact, the diggers and levelers was a subject for Joseph Needham, of all people. I mean, he wrote, I think, one of the first attempts to recover them in 1939. Uh, you then come through into um, the 50s where, you know, there's E.P. Thompson, of course, writing again, starting with Cobbett coming forward. E.P. Thompson, interestingly, also enters the little English other world in, he did once, he read a letter to the Guardian, which I've always cherished, in which he identified Reagan and Thatcher as Gandalfs. So, you know, he, there's this interesting mixture in, in and Tony Jupp destroyed, very, was very rude about Thompson and called him a terrible little Englander. And there was, I think, something of that in Thompson. He was using this tradition in its imaginative otherworldliness as well as in its early history. But I wanted to end by trying to suggest that there does come a point where the critique, we've got to run on a bit, keep going, keep going. That's it, that's what I want. The one before. That's Isles of Wonder, and this is, uh, Jan mentioned this earlier. Um, what, what I wanted to say about this is that this is indeed the little world. It is indeed little England. Um, and I remember when we first saw these models before the event, um, I was thinking, I can't believe it. And, you know, is this really going to work? I mean, how can they dare to do this? this you know, because, I mean, in t trying to write about this question of Little England, one does meet an awful lot of, are you sure? Is this really, shouldn't we just forget about this stuff? Um, and then suddenly here's Danny Boyle, who's 
obviously, I don't know whether it's Cobbett, but it certainly feels like it. I mean, the, the island utopia is even part of the image. I was always very pleased that he didn't put a stately home there, um, although I'm never sure whether that's Baucus's shack or whether it's a sort of IRA den, because there's a sort of Irish connection to it. But certainly what you've got there is a visual list. And going back to my collection of lists that Jamie Muir and I are recovering, I mean, when, when this thing went up successfully, uh, well, we did get, that's the next one. I mean, you know, this is actually the story I've been telling you. And there's no question about the connectedness of this, because this section was called Pandemonium, and it was inspired by Humphrey Jennings's book called Pan Pandemonium, which is a study of the coming of machinery and industrialization into the British landscape. So, you know, we are looking at the another version, if you like, of the same story. And in the press that uh, followed this, we have followed the success of this event, of course, there was lots of enthusiasm. Um, let me give you a quote. Only we can do this with our culture. Only we can play it straight, silly, tragic, funny, sad, funny again. Only we, descendants of Shakespeare and Milton, Dickens and Charlie Chaplin, Anton Deck. That was Giles Corrin in the Times. Um, but the lists do reappear. And this is actually partly thanks to a man named Rick Smith, who was the music director of this event. How do you start to summarize the very sounds of a place, he writes, when in just under 200 years, one small border town is capable of producing both Edward Elgar and F. Buttons. You can't, so you don't even try. You follow you, your heart and you look for the defining moments in culture, the sounds that continue to resonate. And then he says, it's the peal of bells drifting miles across the Welsh valleys, and it's the shudder of bass that shakes the foundations of an underground house club in Dalston. It's the gentle picking of guitar strings around a festival campfire, and it's the bombast of a band at the height of their powers playing beneath the impossible arch of Wembley Stadium. It's the tinny sound of R&B coming from a mobile phone speaker on the top deck of a bus, and it's the children's choir from Southwark. It's the distant echo of steel pans. It goes on a bit, but there's my, the final list I'm going to offer you. The point I want to make about this is not only that these people did what British theatres or modern theatres have been doing for years, which is they defied the assumption that roots should dictate performance. So, for example, there was no sense that although the world was like a visual list of you know, Orwell's England, the people delivering it and performing it were not sort of vetted for... The, the rootedness, they were, it was a completely mixed contemporary population doing it. And I think the other thing that seems to me to be very interesting about this is that the show was sort of seen all over the world by hundreds of millions of people. Now, I don't want to overread this because I certainly saw it on a television screen in, Ita in Italy and when it, I was away when it happened. And the perplexity of the commentators was quite something to witness. I mean, they were trying to figure out what on earth is going on. But at the same time, it does seem to me that, you know, what we've got is this, instead of saying, okay, we've just got to put this away, I think this idea of encroachment and displacement and dislocation has an extraordinary currency, which, you know, m reminds me of what Marx said in the, I'm not saying this is an ist, but it's interesting that in, in Capital, Marx actually talked about, he used the word encroachment. He said, after Capital had taken centuries to extend the working day to its normal maximum limit, and then beyond this limit of the natural day of 12 hours, there followed, with the birth of mechanization and modern industry in the last third of the 18th century, an avalanche of violent and unmeasured encroachments. Every boundary set by morality and nature, age and sex, day and night was broken down. Even the ideas of day and night, which in the old statutes were of peasant simplicity, became so confused that an English judge, as late as 1860, needed the penetration of an interpreter of the Talmud to explain judiciously, judicially, what was day and what was night. Capital was celebrating its orgies. Now, what you've got there is, is an obvious sort of a, a reminder that this, the history that has produced these weird sort of goblin-like um, strange ideas of what an English person is and might be is actually not parochial. The manifestation may be 
limited and provincial and nationally defined. But the actual process was enormous and global, even in 1860. England got it first because the land was cleared first. Industrialism was pioneered in England and then it was moved around the world. And it seemed to me that the, the, the success of um, the Isles of Wonder, which had all the makings of a complete catastrophe waiting to happen, I mean, I couldn't believe it. When we saw in the in first images, the press was understandably cautious. But the interesting thing about this is that this idea of being torn, of being dislocated, of being, ups of being disturbed by movement as well as enabled by it is something that is part of the global condition. I mean, we live in an age of endlessly global flows, cultural, personal, um, and the rest of it. And what seems to me to be an interesting thing to think that this encourages me to think about at least is that there must be ways in which we can talk about this which are not simply surrendering to a kind of morbid backwardness or which actually uses that sense of anxiety and difficulty and dislocation and well, that recognizes it not as something that only applies to a few Fenland farmers who don't like Polish migrants picking the potatoes that they're not prepared to pick themselves, um, but it's actually a condition that we need to deal with. So I mentioned post-colonial studies earlier on. It's fine to me that people should be focusing on the experience of the migrant, but this story suggests that everybody also has a susceptibility and an interest and a stake in the experience of the, the people who find themselves stuck in this situation and residualized by it. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very, very much, Patrick, for this wonderful lecture. Um, uh, a formal notice of thanks is now given by uh, Chris Mitchell, who within two seconds of meeting me just earlier on had sussed me out and asked me only to say two sentences about him. Uh, so I will. Um, he is uh, a filmmaker. He's the managing director of OK Media. Um, he has just, uh, amongst most recent films, uh, is, is, for instance, a film about the Egyptian Revolution, which was just shown a couple of days ago, uh, but also um, topics on which he's made films recently include uh, one on the Euro crisis, uh, which was shown on, BBC, on the BBC. Um, but most importantly, he is an old friend uh, um, of uh, Patrick's, uh, and they've also done a number of projects uh, together. So, um, Chris, we're looking forward to your response. Um, thank you. Um, very much, Jan, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy uh, to thank Patrick, or as we should now style him, Professor Wright, uh, for this exceptionally stimulating lecture um, this evening. Uh, it was absolutely characteristic of Patrick, and I'm not going to give a, a kind of formal academic vote of thanks because I'm not a formal academic. In fact, I'm not an academic at all, as, as Jan just pointed out. But I have known Patrick for many years, and I've been um, gratified and stimulated and provoked on uh, numerous occasions by his flow of thought and his amazingly well-stocked mind and his ability to make the most astonishing connections between various phenomena um, in this uh, strange island we inhabit. Um, th that was absolutely vintage right, I have to say. It really was. Uh, little worlds, big thoughts, immensely stimulating thoughts. And uh, he's almost impossible, as I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling, he's almost impossible to summarize. Um, you, I start making notes on, on, on the few things that I would like to draw out of that, and it rapidly becomes, uh, becomes self-defeating because I would end up replicating his entire lecture. Um, it's, it's a little bit like the, uh, the Borges story that Will Self was talking about, if any of you were here the night before last, at the discussion between him and Patrick, about the attempt to produce a map which actually adequately relates the country for which uh, it's intended and ends up being exactly the same size as that country. If, if I attempt to discuss Patrick, I'll end up speaking for as long. So I'm not even going to uh, start. But I mean, there are some amazing things that stick in my mind. Um, as you absolutely rightly point out, this moment of national self-congratulation, which Isles of Wonder completely epitomized. Um, I love the portrayal of Donald Trump as, a, as Faust. Um, I love the uh, uh, unexpected description of Chesterton as an English Taoist. I love the 
political, I mean, beyond all the multifarious, pointillist uh, cultural references, which are so absolutely typical of the way that you think and, uh, and write. I love the political framework, which unobtrusively but provocatively um, underwrites or subtends what you say. I, that, that's something which, again, is absolutely typical of the way Patrick, uh, Patrick thinks. And um, I've been reading Patrick since before I met him. I read, I, I, met, I, I read him first in his very, very first book, which was on living in an old country, as Jan mentioned in his introductory remarks, which was published incredibly 27 years ago. I can't quite believe that. Um, I only met him some years later. And I've been fascinated to track the evolution of his thought since. And also, as, as Jan was saying, I mean, his first three books do very much form a trilogy. And after that, he, he moved into um, adjacent but somewhat distinct areas with the book on Tank, the book on the Iron Curtain, the book on, on, on uh, Passport to Peking, which was most recently published. I am very, very much hopeful that he returns to that extraordinarily um, fertile and stimulating territory which he was working his way through in those early books now. And I think listening to this lecture um, makes me uh, it makes me look forward very much to a return to this territory of, of, of digging over England and uh, really the uncut version if you like I mean he said that there were lots of things that he'd had to leave out of this particular lecture I hope that he publishes the lecture in its entirety and I hope it also forms the basis of, uh, of a book because I think he has a great deal more to say um, so mr. chairman I say once again uh, we're all most grateful to Patrick, and I'd like you now to express your appreciation in the usual way. Thank you, Patrick. Right, before I formally close this, uh, this lecture and uh, uh, invite you all for drinks, um, please just allow me um, um, uh, for one minute um, to um, note that uh, we are almost now at the end of our Arts and Humanities Festival, uh, which has hosted um, this lecture. Um, which, and this has been a series of, of events. There are three or four going on tonight. Um, uh, and, and of course, all of you can, can see the wonderful uh, Greg Whelan's boat out there as you, as you leave the building uh, and, and as it will be illuminated. So this is just one of those uh, wonderful moments of this festival. Um, and I just want to thank, take this opportunity. There's much more going on tomorrow, so there's no excuse for not turning up then. Um, but because we are in this magnificent venue tonight, I just wanted, um, with Patrick's indulgence, um, to just spend a very quick moment um, to thank those uh, who have done so much to make this uh, uh, festival possible. Um, we'll have a, not everybody can be here, so, so I'll, 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 uh, I, I will say a few internal words um, uh, to them to the next, uh, to them tomorrow. Um, and I will, so this is not just a measly uh, way of not presenting gifts, but I would like to just uh, uh, acknowledge, especially the, the work of the team around, uh, led by Pelagia, but uh, including also Anik, uh, Laura uh, and Ola, um, who've, who've just um, done so much to um, provide us with a seamless series of events and who've shown extraordinary good grace uh, and quickness of mind when the odd thing didn't work out quite so well. Um, and we're particularly indebted also to Max Saunders, who's the director of the Arts and Humanities Research Institute who, and who is also a member of the English department and again who has done uh, so much to, uh, has been so instrumental in bringing about this uh, this event, this festival, um, through his inspiration, through his ideas, uh, and through, again, through the huge amount of work that he's put in uh, over this time. And what I would have uh, done finally, uh, the, the, the people who I would like to thank, um, and I'm not quite sure if they're coming out. They are coming in now. So um, the people who are actually almost uh, as important, or if not more important than, than anybody else, um, are actually this, the, the people who, who serve us with our wine and our drinks uh, every night. <laughs> Um, these poor people have been uh, really performing fantastically uh, every night of, over the last two weeks. Um, and it is really quite proper that we just um, uh, thank them formally for, for making these events so special because, of course, what happens now, the conversations we'll have over a nice glass of wine uh, and sparkling wine uh, is, 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 is just such an important part 
of uh, making this a special event. Um, so to, to them in particular, but to all the ones that I've just mentioned, I wonder if we can have a very quick round of applause. <laughs> And now can I all invite you to uh, some drinks at Chapters uh, upstairs. Uh, so if you just go up the stairs and uh, you'll find it very easy. Thank you. <laughs>